Uh, and today I'm going to share with you a completely different set of uh, projects and work from what I talked about last time, which is my experiences of working in Mumbai, which is emblematic, really, of the idea of engaging with a place that you really work in. And architects and designers, I believe, working in India today are now dealing with an entire gamut of social, cultural, and economic phenomena that are molding the built environment at incredibly rapid rates. And in this process, I believe the role of the professional architect has been marginalized. From within conventional praxis, the profession doesn't really engage with the broader landscape, but rather chooses to operate uh, with the specificity of the site, and the process often becomes disconnected with the context of practice. And so this notion of the context of practice is what uh, this title sort of reflects, and it's emblematic of that sort of form of engagement. And so our approach of working in Mumbai has been to actually use the city and the region of our operation as the generator of practice, as a way for us to evolve and approach an architectural vocabulary, I believe, that draws its nourishment, so to speak, from a more elastic definition of the profession, which sees multiple disciplines as being simultaneously valid in engaging with what I call this kinetic urban landscape, which is what I spoke about here in three, year, three years ago, of Indian cities and their peri-urban regions. So I think this idea of also engaging uh, with a place often or oh, always does surface this idea of the local. Uh, and um, uh, I think the idea of the local as the resistance to globalization I think has run its course because the evocation of local specificity, I believe, fetishizing the local, whether it's craft, tradition, material, is a way, I think, an easy way, a simplistic way to crit critique the homogenizing effects of globalization. And it results in this sort of phenomena of the fetish as a way of resistance. But I think the notion that globalization amounts to homogeneity also for me is a dead concept. Flog for too long to be productive for us as designers. And I, I'm speaking from the perspective of us as designers, what might nourish us? Because differences are not just about local specificity, but about how these differences are networked globally. And therefore, the productive arguments are really what are the meta-narratives by which we can see what the context is. My colleague at the GSD, Neil Brenner, uses this question of what is the context of the context? And this is where these interconnections uh, about the global networks and the local specificity play themselves out in very interesting ways. So urban India in the post-liberalized economy starting in the 1990s, which is when I started my practice, is characterized by physical and visual contradictions that coalesce in a landscape of incredible pluralism, which is charged with polarities of all sorts. With globalization and the emergence of a post-industrial service-based economy in Indian cities, Urban space has been fragmented and polarized with the rich and poor jostling for access to amenities. And this is, I mean, the image that we all have, and it is true. Further, the state, which is very important, has more or less given up the responsibility of projecting the, an idea of India through the built-in physical environment as it had done in the past, in the post-independence era, with the several state capitals. And this is what makes the timing of this exhibition incredibly wonderful for this lecture, where state capitals, governments, educational campaigns, campuses across the country in the subcontinent were built. Today, the major state-directed projects are highways, flyovers, airports, telecommunication networks, electricity grids, which connect urban centers but don't contribute to guiding their physical structure. It's really about destination and arrival more than buildings uh, as uh, objects. Uh, and there's a new statistical architecture that the state uses, which is GDP, economic growth. That is the result uh, of the whole liberalization process. And Really, and I think the exhibition is wonderful because it's a real contrast to another moment in our, in our history. In the India's post-liberalized economy, cities and their peripheries have also become sites for the shifting responsibility and, and evolving relationship between private and public enterprise. Today, private capital chooses to build environments that are insulated from their context without the burden of facilitating citizenship or placemaking necessary in a real city. These gated communities take the form of vertical towers in the inner city, sprawling suburban compounds on the periphery. In fact, the state-controlled economy, in the state-controlled economy, the physical relationship between different classes uh, was often orchestrated according to a master plan. Again, in the exhibition, you see this clearly, founded upon entitlement to housing, proximity to employment, etc. In the new economy, the fragmentation of services and production locations has resulted in a new bazaar-like urbanism that has woven its 
presence through the entire urban landscape. And of course, it creates these incredible polarities as a result of this. Uh, and, and, and of course, what are the, therefore, what are the meta-narratives by which we can begin to understand this context, what is the context of the context. And, you know, there are many we can discuss, but I think for me the interesting ones have been the idea that now we have a mutinous democracy in this post-liberalized uh, economy. And what I mean by mutinous democracy is it's coalition after coalition, fractured coalition. It's really the Italian model, perhaps. Uh, there's also, uh, and well, we have an Italian leader, so we can't help that. Uh, uh, it also, I think, what Eve Blau has uh, referred to when she talks about East Europe, the notion of simultaneous transition is a very, very important one because what happens is many of these economies and regions are simultaneously transitioning out of an, a, a set like socialism and transitioning into capitalism. These are never clear thresholds. The transitions are in simultaneous occurrence. East Europe is experiencing this. I believe India is experiencing this too, where where, 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 where the baggage of socialism, its ideology, and its sort of aspirations uh, all occur simultaneously with new aspirations towards a capitalist model. And the built environment is where this reflects in, in the most sort of startling uh, way. So that's another one of these meta-narratives which are very critical uh, to, to understand. And of course, the question of the state, its devolving of power. I think these meta-narratives become very helpful in understanding uh, the context of the context. And if you look at what's happening even in our urban landscape, it's interesting that you know the seven megacities that we are all focused on is not the future of India. The real urban time bomb is these cities, which are going to be a million people each in the next 20 or 30 years, so which means there are going to be 400 million P Indians living in places we don't even talk about today. Uh, and I really, we, we can't even name more than five or 10 because these are off everybody's radar. And they're 100,000 people towns, so they are bigger than most European towns. Uh, and so it's a humongous problem. And it's interesting how, for the profession, you know, on the first map, what you have there is what I call the axis of modernism, uh, which is Chandigarh, New Delhi, Ahmedabad, where Corp built the new capitals, Mumbai, Goa, with Charles Correa's sort of interventions, Pondicherry, which was, you know, where the French had been, and there was a kind of tradition because of the ashram there. Now you have, a, and, and in this axis, there was, not only these were places of economic generation, I mean, they, they were generators of the economy, but this is also where the project of modernism plays, played itself out as an aesthetic, as an approach, as the sets of processes and protocols that went with the production of the built environment using those sort of uh, approaches. Now you have the new economy in this sort of axis, uh, Hyderabad, Chennai, you know, Bangalore, Cochin, and this is free, actually, of the culture of modernism and the protocols that it... They are completely different things and aspirations and even processes uh, that inform the built environment in this area. And then with the smaller towns, you're going to have this sort of fusion between many different kinds of protocols. And so therefore, the question of what are the models of engagement, I come back to the question of engagement, in this emerging uh, scenario, I think becomes a big question uh, for us as architects. And again, I think one of the other important uh, meta-narratives, so to speak, is this incredible disjuncture which occurred in Latin America, parts of Africa, but India really specifically, and again, I have to refer to the exhibition, this is where I think in the case of India, aesthetic modernity arrived before social modernity. In Europe, the aesthetic modernization process came out of the social modernization process. Here, through a group of charismatic architects, we had aesthetic, and designers, we had aesthetic modernity arrive there before. It's wonderful to see the Eames India report in the exhibition. And I think in, in many ways, the exhibition captures uh, that moment, uh, not only in that control room in the exhibition, all this literature on tropical architecture and you know all the kind kind of documents that informed how housing would be approached and the construction of a completely new imagination for society. It was, but the society hadn't modernized. And this disjuncture, I think we deal with even today. And it's a really important one. This is a collage by David Wilde, who has sort of done these beautiful collages that evoke some of these disjunctures, I think, in very beautiful ways. So going back to Mumbai. I think working in Mumbai is about negotiating landscapes where global flows don't erase and remake landscapes, but are forced to occupy local fissures, creating fascinating hybrid conditions, startling adjacencies. And some practitioners refer to this as the informal city. 
I think this is a fundamental problem because I think when we set up these binaries, they're non-productive for design. And many of these binaries create alliances and spaces which don't allow us to think, I think, uh, critically enough in terms of design. So that is how one would sort of describe this. And so I use the word kinetic, where there is another intelligence by which one can actually discern the logic by which, which, which this is made. I mean, you know, Vikram Bhatt's seminal work, who is a resident here, on how the other half builds, for example, shows the precise logic in the making of settlements in what I call the kinetic city or the informal world as other people refer to it in this landscape. And Mumbai perhaps challenges this neat equation of the binary where we might situate ourselves as designers and more importantly how we might be inspired by the design intelligence of the informal to act and intervene as designers and activists in our own localities. And I think these are some, there are some specific aspects that come out of this which have borne substantially I believe on the nature of our practice. And one of them has been the idea of the social as material that one has to actually work, it, work with because its implications, I believe, both on organizational aspects of buildings and technology, technology and how it's embraced uh, is, is, is very, very critical. Uh, and I kind of define the kinetic city by these parameters, which is that of elasticity, of incrementalism, and of appropriation, but most importantly of how one can create, because the, I think the kinetic city, as I sort of understand it, one of the things about it is thresholds are very soft. And architecture plays an amazing role in hardening these thresholds. And how can one be aware as designers in trying to configure conditions where these thresholds are, are softer. So Mumbai, as it's now referred to, like several cities in India in the post-industrial scenario, has resulted in a new system with this fragmentation, this bazaar-like urbanism, uh, what Ravi Sundaram, a scholar, refers to as a pirate modernity that slips under the laws of the city simply to survive without any conscious attempt at constructing a counterculture. And this phenomena is critical for the city being connected to the global economy. However, the spaces it creates have been largely excluded from the cultural discourse on globalization, which focuses on elite domains of production in the city. It's not the city of the poor, as the regular models of formal and informal and other such binaries might suggest, but it's a kinetic space, a space where these models actually collapse into a singular entity in space where meanings are shifting and blurred. And the kinetic city obviously cannot be seen, and I don't want to suggest as a design tool, but rather a demand that conceptions of urbanism create and facilitate environments that are versatile, flexible, robust, and ambiguous enough to allow the kinetic quality of the city uh, to flourish. And so. Of course, incrementalism, uh, this is a diagram I love, which is called the five stages of squatting, uh, which is exactly how the city is made. Uh, someone arrives, this guy's in the third stage of squatting, uh, and slowly space is appropriated, and they become part of the paraphernalia. And of course, you can deconstruct this into types. It's related to the index of security. There are many types of this sort of transacting in the kinetic space. But it also expands to public space, and so during festivals, for example, a space like this gets appropriated by the the community, so instead of building another community center, they actually build one, but only for 10 days. Uh, and it's built in paper mache. It's sort of, uh, it's covered. It takes over the street. There are Bollywood films there. There's celebration. And in 10 days, it disappears, and the street goes back to normal. And you can think of many, many examples. This is a lecture in itself, so I won't go into this. But also density, for example, here, that is the green space in Mumbai in, in, in proportion. And that's in scale. Uh, and even to Delhi, you can, you can see what the difference is. And of of course, it's also fragmented, unlike New York. And so this, of course, results in other kinds of innovation. And cricket, uh, these cricket fields, um, this wonderful game I always describe as this Indian game that the British invented, um, uh, is, is, is uh, you know, these spaces are then appropriated for weddings in the evenings. Uh, the pitch is not touched because that's sacred space. But this thing wraps around it, and it again disappears in the morning. And so this sense of elasticity is incredible. And I think what it demonstrates in terms of, for us as a design, is how these binaries actually get dissolved, how they begin to appropriate each other and even the spectacle of the city is no longer architecture. It's the simultaneity of temporal spectacles, in this case, the Ganesh Festival, where this great idol of the god, 500 of these big idols, 7 million people participate, is, 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 is immersed at the sea, at the foot of the static city, so to speak. But, 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 but the, the, the simultaneous operation of these sets of images kind of fold into each other, meanings slip. It's an enacted process. There is no formal mechanism to uh, really encode uh, this spectacle. 
spectacle, as opposed to a condition like this, which is what I call the, uh, the landscape of impatient capital, uh, where architecture is the only spectacle of the city. Uh, and so I think the, the, the argument of the kinetic city is how one extends this definition uh, to be able to create these sort of simultaneities. Uh, and of course, the other extreme here is reclaiming and repair and preservation. And so I begin to now move into our own projects. And so we've been involved in the post-industrial landscapes uh, in Mumbai, both at the level of policy, but also in reclaiming spaces. And I, the two weeks I spent here in the summer, I was really, I learned a lot from looking at what happened here with the waterfront and hearing the stories of how these movements started. Uh, very, very instructive. And here what we tried to do was bo work both at the level of policy, we haven't been as successful as you have been here, but also beginning to reclaim little spaces in places where we knew these sheds and spaces wouldn't last for more than a few years, but making them art spaces, getting the elite to go into these areas uh, to look at and recognize that these landscapes exist. And so these are very simple projects where with minimal restoration, we actually created spaces uh, which could be used for purposes like this here, a little car garage, which became a very popular, or is yet a very popular space for installation art in the city because it suddenly uh, allows a volume uh, which would have otherwise been pulled down into a building, and that subtle grid you see uh, allows all sorts of configurations in terms of hanging without compromising really the integrity of what was just simply a car garage or an old printing press, which we recently converted into an art space too, as part of that landscape, which led us then into looking and engaging much more with preservation, uh, because I think this is really the, the other end of... Uh, you know, making our landscapes frictionless for capital to arrive from all over the globe, manifest itself very quickly, and create these landscapes of impatient capital. I think conservation, preservation becomes a form of resistance to that if spaces can be appropriated and recycled. And this is the conservation of a palace complex in Hyderabad. You see the Char Minar in the corner for people who might know it, the Great Mosque. And this had been encroached upon uh, illegally, you might say. And what you see in red is all the encroachments. So this was a, a complex project which involved lawyers to stabilize the space and in this great density to make it a public space. Uh, and of course it required measured drawings, which again I think is, is important as part of that process. It involved dealing with m many different kinds of material. I mean that one column in lime takes three months to build. You suddenly begin to look at the dimension of time quite differently uh, in preservation, uh, in building back uh, this with these different, and of course making it a public space with very, very frugal kind of inputs uh, uh, here, uh, uh, a part which is a museum. We had no funds for air conditioning and humidification, but it was about the legacy of the Nizam's family uh, who ruled uh, in the state of Hyderabad. And this was a central building called the Kilwat, which also had a wonderful Darbar Hall, which was restored. That entire space was restored. I mean, that whole ceiling is brand new, and I think we can afford this in, in India because craft is yet available and labor cheap, and this distinction between what is labor and craft is another, I think, political question uh, which we, uh, we, we should touch upon at some point. But in post-colonial conditions, preservation becomes complicated, and so here, you know, in this kind of condition, like in Mumbai, for example, the creators of an environment and the custodians of an environment are two different cultures. And this is, I think, in all post-colonial situations, preservation has to deal with this. It makes it more interesting, but also makes it more complicated. And here you see these two guys gazing at these statues. We have wonderful statues, British statues, which when we went into our right-wing politics, they moved from public spaces. Priceless statues, and they kind of stuck them in a little museum on the periphery of the Bombay Zoo, so to speak. No, literally, uh, it was a political kind of act. Uh, but it also shows that this sort of complex relationship between the custodians and the creators being two different cultures. And so we began to get involved through this engagement with legislation because we were very keen to save the historic district in Mumbai. And uh, four or five years after I went back from studying urban design, I got involved in this project because I found most people were, who were involved in the preservation movement were just listing buildings, and I felt unless one made an urban conservation argument for it, one couldn't address policy in any substantial way. And in 1995, we got what was in India the first heritage regulation policy uh, in the country for a living kind of urban area, and this sort of began to protect this area. And this is an overview of that area. The few high rises are the aberrations. That's the Taj Mahal Hotel and the Stock Exchange, but it's otherwise, even in terms of its urban form, quite well uh, preserved. 
But in, in, in passing this legislation, we realized that there was no action on the ground. And so we went back to excavate what might be the contemporary engines that could drive the process. And this was very interesting because it began to question uh, the tenants because, you know, you usually discern the significance of an area and you're killing yourself then to to reinforce the significance of that area as it existed historically. But in the post-colonial condition, that is not a valued argument because uh, the, the culture that now occupies it doesn't relate to it in the same way, and you can't use nostalgia as easily. So we began to construct a significance. Now, here for the architect, the task becomes complex because you have to then be responsible for keeping the illusion of the architecture intact while draining the area of its ideological content, its associative values in some ways, to to, to let a contemporary engine emerge. And so we began to redefine the district in terms of a banking district, an art district, a tourist district, to give it personality, but also to, to use a new use to weld people together uh, to make that difference. And so we, I mean, I'll just show you one example. Again, this is a much longer discussion. But this was what was a district that had never historically been an art district. It had a bunch of buildings. But we found art and museums had begun to find their way in there. So we began to, as activists, bring people together, register associations. It was five years of work to, to get this organized in a way that they had a common agenda. It became the contemporary engine, so to speak. And galleries were always already there. And we started it with an interesting but a small move, which was just whitewashing a building that hadn't been painted for 20 years. Uh, and it cost us $500, including the bamboo scaffolding, which the restaurant at the bottom paid for. And it changed the quality of light. It suddenly gave the, the association incredible credibility that they had managed to do this. It's interesting how sometimes a little move like that can galvanize an area. And it became an art district by just organizing a festival. It's now been 12 years. It's now called the art district. Uh, this is what pays for it. Uh, artists sort of draw things. That's Hussein, who is like our Picasso, who did this um, painting, which was sold to raise money. We started using interstitial spaces for children. Uh, we began to take things like a parking lot and through the money generated in the festival, pave it so it could be used for concerts at night. Street furniture signage, which is very low in the government's priority, naturally, because they have bigger problems. Uh, and then using buildings as backdrops for concerts, performances. It began to, began to animate the space, but also change its association and gave it a kind of identity. And then grade one buildings were restored using all the tenants that you would apply to a grade one building, rigorously done using the money that was raised as a result of this partnership, which was public and private in this case. And so it, of course, was about keeping the illusion of architecture intact, but it was a, another approach. It wasn't creating a master plan, but ra rather, in this case, working bottoms up, bottom up. But, but the architect had to then be the surveyor who made sure we were on the right track. And then we began to focus on the museum. And these were self-initiated projects. We talked to them about how they could become more integrated with this art district, which is around them. And we found that this warehouse, which had just one window to hoist things up. These are just a false facade. 50,000 square feet wasn't being used efficiently. So we came up with an idea of adding a veranda and a circulation system in a skylight and opening up 50,000 square feet by extending the elevation of the building, uh, but doing it in a sort of contemporary way. Uh, and so we used sort of new materials, uh, reversible, separate from the historic building, so another generation could remove it. But you began to animate and include now 50,000 square feet uh, to the district, so which only reinforces the idea. And more recently, a little visitor center, which acts as a gateway building to the old museum, because otherwise there were many sheds with security and for baggage. So cleaning up that mess in a kind of content, again, built in a way that another generation could reverse it. Wrapping it just around an existing building and trees as a canopy. This is where you give your, take your bags back when you leave. So it's sort of abstract in that it's not sort of you know, shouting out it's a security booth, uh, but becomes a real gateway uh, to the museum complex. And um, you know, the shiny surfaces also reflect this uh, imagery and kind of dissolves uh, in its everyday experience. Of course, this engagement is also about uh, the macro scale. And I think Mirko referred to the Urban Design Research Institute, which I was involved with for 10 years, which began to look at 
the Docklands in Mumbai, which is 1,800 acres of land. And we've sort of done very detailed studies and yet talking to the government to see what implications that might have on the region and how one can... So, so it's, I think, about an engagement with all scales, and it's critical that one zooms back and forth, uh, which has been uh, part of, uh, I think, our engagement there. And of course, this region is urbanizing very fast. The rich are building there. And so how does one then, as an architect, begin to engage with those questions? within this understanding of the context of the context. And so this is typically what happens there. These are big villas the rich build. And I met this contractor, asked him the name of the architect. He said, no, I designed it myself. My client gave me a picture with a White House from Washington, and I copied it. <laughs> and so that's what it became. So it was a White House. And it's interesting because, you know, I mean, this is the the bungalow, which is the basis for this, which has a privacy gradient, a, a colonial thing for us in a sense. So as opposed to the traditional Indian town where the courtyard, it's like, a, and that's the Palladian villa in a sense, and this is an inside out version of it, and a complete inversion uh, in terms of not only where the ostentation is sort of um, um, uh, uh, you know, displayed, uh, but also in terms of its autonomy as an object, in, in terms of its isolation. And so we've of course been involved with a series of projects as we were starting our practice and trying to address this issue. So this was the first one where what we convinced the client to do was we said, you're going to be here only for 20 days in the year, so why don't you make your living room a gift to the community? So that's the living room, which has loose furniture, which is where they would sit anyway in the veranda. And when they go away, they put the furniture in, and this portico belongs to the village. So the caretaker lives there. He sits there, does homework with his daughter. I've even seen a wedding happen there. Uh, he gets friends to have tea. So it becomes a space that people can use, at least as a gesture, if nothing else. Uh, and of course, in plan, uh, it's sort of you know, it's for urban people, uh, and so it's, it's for a filmmaker, so it's modulated with courtyards and apertures, uh, which can be controlled to create darkness for coolness and light when they needed it. And this is the portico, which has also taps. The roofs collect the water, and there's a well that's always full, and this tap is also open to anyone around to come and help themselves, because people here the owners only use it for 20 days. And so this really worked well, and this is, I'm sorry, the slide is a bit, but it's sort of, the apertures allow you to regulate light in many different ways. Another project in an orchard outside Ahmedabad, uh, and in the orchard, this is where you would place the house, which is the commanding point where the master's house is for an, we decided to put the house in the center of the orchard, where you could code it in a way, there were openings by which the people who worked in the orchard could also use the water to clean the fruit, uh, to use the courtyard when the owners of the house uh, weren't there. And this is a hot, dry climate, so of course views were framed, porticos with shade created, uh, a, a water body, sort of this, we celebrated the idea of the liquid, and it's like an oasis when you come in. But the workers can actually access this uh, when the place is closed uh, and the owners are not there. So this idea of double coding is for me very interesting. It sort of relates also to the notion of thresholds and how you can soften them. And this is an urban house where we tried to do the same thing. It's a series of gardens at different levels and courtyards, a very kind of enigmatic facade because this a guy also ran a foundation for alternate dance uh, and this is his temple on the terrace it's a very conservative society with and that is his gym so he can jump out and use the lap pool but it also has a platform for performing classical artists and in the evenings he transforms the space into a performance arena where these doors slip off this is the living room which becomes an extension. They put carpets out and they have music performances there. So it becomes institutional in a sense uh, at night. And I think these thresholds are also much easier because of our climate, but also I think society is organized that way where uh, I think the poor, the rich, they have a kind of synergistic relationship to some extent in terms of service, uh, in terms of uh, uh, tasks sort of and employment. And there's a kind of affinity rejection relationship where it's, it's a simultaneous tension which is very interesting, uh, but it, 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 I think these boundaries blur much more easily in those conditions. And of course, it's linked to the issue of inequity, um, which I'll come to in a second. Uh, and I think when these are all commissions for rather wealthy people, where I think the tension becomes much more evident, uh, opposed to maybe public spaces or, or, or other buildings. And this last project for a house, which is on a tea plantation, where the client wanted to cut the tea and do a villa, but we convinced them to kind of not touch the tea. We did mock-ups which touched the 
the site as minimally as it could. And we basically placed three bedrooms in these boxes clad in wood under this big roof. And it's interesting, everyone in the locality calls it the tea factory. Uh, they don't even refer to it as a villa or a house. So just in its imagery, it's managed to diffuse that. And it's just a spine which is built in the local granite with these three rooms and a large veranda. Even the living is sunk in to the landscape, so furniture is even not sort of visible. Uh, and when you look from outside, that when the tea workers look in here, they just see a space. But also this area has a lot of mist and this allows the mist in terms of creating an atmosphere to go through the house. Uh, and of course, we used lots of local craft. We used apertures in a way to create interesting moments of light. Uh, and it allowed a, a very easy relationship between people <coughs> who use the house and people who work uh, on the tea plantation. And, and it allows the mist, as I said, to sort of actually go through the house and amplify some of the textures, the colors uh, in the process of doing that. And of course, that leads to the question of weather, which is very important for us, and weathering. Uh, and how does one respond to the weather? Uh, this is a little project for a think tank uh, in Goa, uh, which has a really tropical climate. And you enter through that wall in this tube, which is clad in copper, uh, which gets patternized in age. And it's a last, large steel frame, which supports clay tiles, under which uh, are a series of rooms that can be used both from below and above. Uh, so it allows for pla places for people to meet, even sleep in the good weather uh, on a mattress, and it allows a great amount of flexibility and is yet very social, uh, very loose uh, in, in its volumetric and sectional sort of construct, but also uh, incorporates the textures of the local materials, in this case, laterite uh, and, and uh, and, and, and mangalow tiles or clay tiles. And, and then how does one actually extend this? This is very interesting for us. How do you place, make places for the rain? Uh, you know, of course, the architecture of Jeffrey Bauer and many others set the precedent for this. But the sense of being able to enjoy uh, places and cities and right through a spectrum of seasons, uh, I think I know it's an obsession in Montreal too, uh, but um, it is very important. And I think weathering and weather is related very much to it because our debates have moved to weather from weathering. And so our obsession um, with sealants and insulation uh, has become the norm. And of course, in some climates, it's more critical than in other climates. But this debate between weatherproofing and weathering, I think, is one that needs to sort of be resurrected in some ways because it's related to questions of sustainability. And, and with preservation, how does it loop back to this? It makes us very interested in the life cycle of materials. And like in this house, this is basalt from the site, uh, which we know will have a life of 50 or 100 years. You don't need to touch it. It's been like 15 years. We have not done anything with it, but the roofs need to be changed every 15 years, and we just changed them when the house was 15 <coughs> years old. It's much lighter. So by separating materials, can one actually build that into our imagination, uh, which again, I think, is a debate that has sort of gone out. And technologies, this is for the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. It's a rural campus where you get three inches of rain, so it's about water harness it's about courtyards, it's about passive cooling. Uh, we used wind scoops with water humidification to cool the buildings. It's really like a ship in almost a desert uh, and, and, and how one makes that work. One learned a lot from it. I think many things failed. One realized lifestyles are very much linked to these questions and if lifestyles don't adjust to passive kind of mechanisms, uh, I think they're not as efficient. But we also explored ferro-cement construction here, which was light, but also allowed for insulation, uh, training local people to be able to build this and to carry it inexpensively to site uh, and hopefully construct skills. But then that, of course, adds constraints and a rigor in some ways, but a constraint in terms of how you build. Craft in India. And I come back to the idea of labor and craft. And I think this is important because we tend to fetishize craft because, of course, there's a continuity of craft. But we also blur it. Even in the government definition, it's labor. Uh, and how does one reclaim this, uh, not only in extending what might be traditional crafts here. This is temples being built for export from Chennai to Texas, uh, if you believe it. Those are dismantled and then sent off. And it's built all by hand, very beautifully, using techniques from 3,000 years ago. 
But how do you sort of collide these with new technologies? And this is just an image of a carpenter's box I took on one of my sites where, you know, castor oil, heavy duty oil resides with a pantheon of gods. And, and, and this sort of collision, I think for me, is very interesting. And just the last point before I show you some specific projects where some of these issues come together is I think publication, Mirko talked about this. For me, this is also a form of engagement. So we've tried very hard to capture a lot of this as part of the practice in the production of publications which uh, address questions of preservation and debates about that, but also architecture, urbanism. Uh, and so it becomes a very integral part of our working in Mumbai and of our engagement uh, with the city. I'm going to go through these six projects rather quickly. Uh, they are uh, projects that I've sort of defined in these two categories, and I think some of these issues come together. And I call this localizing global programs. I take three projects here, which are what one might say are really global programs, which we don't have a precedent in our tradition. So an information technology campus or a corporate office. Uh, these are new, which have happened as phenomena with the liberalization of our economy and wanting to embrace new ways of doing things. And then globalizing local programs are programs that actually emerge from very specific problems in a particular context. But how do you make them resonate more broadly? Because we land up otherwise caricaturing them. Even clients in their brief tell you, oh, make it like an Indian village. Uh, I was seeing some catalogs in the exhibition about how to intervene in an Indian village. It's about a romantic idea of what the village might be. And so how does one reverse these? And I think this is also part of what I was calling the blurring of binaries, because these binaries also then otherwise become rather non-productive. So the first one is one of our earliest projects from 94. <clears throat> and it was a corporate building just when the economy had liberalized for Lakshmi Machine Works, which is India's largest machine tool company. And this was their brief. They had a, they had a partner in Australia who was going to give them the curtain glazing, garden, parking. It was a simple formula. And of course, for us, it was so depressing, one of our early projects, to be stuck with this. So we managed to, after a lot of work, convince them to do that, which is really a low-slung building uh, appropriate. And we felt that working with an aesthetic of the locality would be a much more powerful way for India's top machine tool company, which has collaborations with companies in Switzerland and Germany, to actually make something of the locality. And so we came up with a building which is really three apertures, three courtyards, big footprint, uh, and it's an internalized world. It's also in the rain shadow, the site, and so water is then used to cool the building. And essentially, it's a large, locally made tile roof within which volumes are sort of configured. And it's for seven companies that are under the umbrella of the machine tool company. And it's essentially three courtyards with water that circulates. And these apertures vary in size, so they give you different light qualities. But from the street, it's very transparent. It's visually totally penetrable. And you can stand at that window. It was actually built on access, so you can stand there and look right through the building. So it also creates a sense of transparency. And as you go through the building, uh, it, it gets more intimate. You hear the sound of water. Uh, the green is sort of telescopic because of the stacking up of the courtyards as a visual kind of device. Uh, and, uh, and, and the hallways are all single loaded corridors. They're verandas, essentially, where people can meet. We had artists. This is Rajiv Sethi, who did a series of installations with other artists uh, where people could meet. Uh, and you hear the water. And it's about six degrees cooler. And as you go through the building, it gets much more intimate in scale. We also had artists work with us on building elements. Manjit Bawa, that's Rajiv Sethi. But he, Manjit Bawa took what he painted uh, on canvas, but began to translate them into a third dimension to create railings for the building uh, and installations through the building, which evoked uh, some mythological sort of scenes and narratives, but otherwise were responding really to the space. And that's the a clay tile, which was locally made. It's made in Mangalore, which is about three or four hours, a three-hour drive uh, from Coimbatore. And then, of course, we used the local granite, which was recycled the strips to construct the water body. So you got the frothing automatically because of the kind of profile that was developed because of the drilling. And then a series of installations, some that had to were architectural, but also had to do with symbolism. This is 104 Lakshmi's, which is the god of wealth, which is the name of the company. And this is all in the southern belt, where I think their contingencies and their aspirations of what they want to represent within these buildings is quite different. It's much more founded on beliefs like the equivalent of Feng Shui, which is Vastu. It's much more conservative in, in terms of also faith and religious beliefs. And the courtyards were surrounded by a series of openings, which 
uh, because it's all naturally ventilated. Uh, and so these were a series of screens that we developed using the metal, the scrap metal from which the machine tool components were made. Because I felt that if the material that gave the company its wealth was configured in the surfaces, it would be a kind of nice thing. And of course, it's inspired by the Mughal Jali uh, or the screen, which is about controlling apertures or light and air uh, in, in different <clears throat> measures. And so this is the about 30 or 35 patterns, which is all from scrap metal, uh, which came out of their company. So we collected the scrap, and then an artist called Yogesh Rawal batched it and began to create patterns uh, through a series of layers that he would create with compatible patterns. And at night, of course, they have a completely different presence. But it's all the recycled material uh, from the factories. And of course, right in front of the toilets, the, 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 the transparency is less. So we kind of created a logic uh, in order to do that at different scales uh, right through the building. The second project is for Ewart Packard, uh, which is the um, Californian company. And they <coughs> were located in Electronic City in Bangalore. This is the information technology hub of India. So you hear about Bangalore. This is Infosys, their campus. They're essentially lawns with autonomous blocks, which are clad in glass. And our client, too, had built three buildings by another architect, which were exactly this, which were glass blocks. And in analyzing them, we found you had software, and then you had common facilities, which was copy, uh, photocopying, coffee machines, meeting rooms. But the segregation was acute. These are young people who worked there, but people had no social space in this. They, they entered through elevators, which were coded, their zones, and they left. Uh, and we came up with a paradigm which tried to reverse that. So we took all of this and accumulated it together as a street with food courts on either end, and then we added the software sort of wings. And everything that you see in gray is not air conditioned. Now, of course, the client being Californian and American wanted a LEED certificate. They wanted a platinum LEED certificate, and this became uh, an issue for us because every time we applied, we were rejected and given a million minus points because we didn't have insulated glass, we didn't have sealed windows because we said this is naturally ventilated. And so what we finally convinced the client was that, look, you gain much more by not air conditioning this. And so the business as usual model is 200 square feet uh, per ton of air conditioning, which is what regular buildings in India do. If you get to 90, 290 square feet per ton, it, you get a platinum LEED certificate. Uh, and so it's 90 square feet more. And we achieve 705 square feet per ton, but not by mechanical or chemical fixes, but by just not air conditioning most of the buildings. So when they saw that average, they realized. Now, so this, I think, of course, points to the whole question of lead, its sort of cultural context, uh, the climatic context. And of course, India has now evolved its own local uh, greha, it's called. Uh, but it also points to what we call intelligent and non-intelligent buildings. I think the whole, you know, I think the debate of sustainability, uh, and I was going through the exhibition today and saying to Marcela that has been, it's been hijacked by the high-tech architects in the 80s. And so the industry has followed, and there's a whole green industry that's now perpetuating a narrative around that. And I think passive approaches, low-tech, uh, I think it's time to, at least for many parts of the world, Mirko talked about Africa and Latin America and India. I mean, of of course, this is where this debate has to go back. And so this is what essentially the building looks like. This is the street with all the common facilities, water, bamboo courts, the software, the generators and backup plants, and big food courts, which are all naturally ventilated. In many points, you can enter the building. And the facade is a collage of staircases, conference rooms. So it's also interesting in the way it can accommodate uh, nature uh, that surrounds it. In this case, there were many existing trees. So those are conference rooms. Those are staircases clad uh, in copper. You can walk below these vo volumes. They're kind of architectural. But within what I was calling the street, there are many different kinds of spaces with different kinds of light quality. And they're very social spaces because people working there are very young. Uh, and it's interesting. I mean, I, when I go on site visits there, you know, the average age jumps because these guys are all in their early 20s. Uh, and they have to meet. But also people who spend their whole day working at a computer to be just reminded about what air feels like, what something smells like, you know, the temperature 
temperature, I think, was important. And the food court is, again, just a series of courtyards that are open, but with spaces of different scales where people can sit. Uh, and these are the courtyards between the software blocks. The software blocks, too, are not in glass, because I realized that in my analysis that people were spending a lot of money on glass facades and speak, spending twice the amount of money on blinds that were automated to control the glare. So, I mean, by just eliminating that, we saved a lot of money. But of course, it's a much cooler building. And then this last project, which extends this idea, is in Hyderabad, which sits in the state of Andhra Pradesh. And this is going through a lot of political rife right now. They're trying to divide the state into two. Uh, and there are riots regularly. People burn cars, throw stones. Uh, and this was the site we had, again, in their information technology city. That's by Mario Botta, which is all clad in brick. But everything else are glass uh, blocks, uh, essentially. And most buildings look like this. Uh, and it's interesting. This is, it's, it's really interesting how these images, even in a place that's strewn with riots on a daily basis, use this kind of vocabulary. So now the vendors who sell you curtain glazing, they actually sell you fishing nets with the curtain glazing so you can be protected from the stones. And they give you options of color for the fishing nets. And they have wonderful details of how the fishing nets can be clipped onto the glass. So it just tells you how compulsive, how, how strong these images are in their relation to global capital and how it must be represented uh, architecturally. And so, of course, for us, the inspiration was something a diametrically opposite. And so we were inspired by this little hut that the government puts up. Uh, they, 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 they put this up um, in Jaipur and many other places, which are also hot, dry climates. And it's a water cooler. That guy works there. He's a government employee. And he comes every morning. And he puts a beautiful brass kettle out there. And he's open for work. Uh, and people come and they drink water. So all you do is put your hand there. There are no paper glasses, there's no plastic, there's no disposable. And people drink cl clean, cool water uh, from this hut that is passively cooled by humidification. And every once in a while, he comes out and he wets it so that it, the temperature drops. Uh, and it's cool water. And within the hut, he, of course, cools it and keeps it humid. Uh, and, uh, and the water is kept in large clay pots. Uh, which also through evaporative cooling keep the water cool. Very, very simple, but inspirational. So we, we said we sh and of course there's kind of a beauty to it too. Uh, and so we came up with this project for this infrastructure company uh, 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 that was a five-story building, but it was also a garden, not a green wall in the way it's become fashionable, where you stick green on the wall, but a performative skin, uh, which also cools the building through a misting system and hydroponic trays with drip irrigation, which minimize the use of water for the plants. But it's a five-story high garden, which is performative. Uh, and every facade is different. And it's essentially three components, a spec building, uh, a, a handmade aluminum trellis, uh, and then plants that grow on it in different patterns, so it's a dynamic facade. And this also had to do, and of course every facade uh, can be different potentially, and then it sits on a podium with parking below it. Now, talking about impatient capital, of course the clients wanted this in a year, 18 months, they wanted to be working there. And so we negotiated with them and we detached the facade from the building. So we said, if you just let us keep the scaffolding up for two more years, we'll replace it with a facade and you can use the building. And they did exactly that. So again, it's this idea idea of impatient capital uh, and how you can strategically locate uh, a kind of move. So this scaffolding over time, they occupied the building and the scaffolding over time got replaced by a facade. So they inaugurated the building with the scaffolding with the cows and you know, the works. And this is again in South India, so it's very traditional. And then we hand constructed uh, a, a, a trellis in aluminium with a kind of texture uh, which replaced the thing. And this was made in a little village, again in South India. And the guy who had made our grills in the other building said, if you keep me employed for two or three years, I can actually set up a business doing that. So he employed about 15 people, and now they have jobs. And the offset or the fallout of the project in the way we had strategically detached these two elements also set up a business uh, in a sense, which uh, I, you know, just in retrospect was something that we became more aware of. Um, and, and so this was, you know, 
uh, the little factory that was set up uh, with these 15 people he employed. Uh, we could have made many molds, but that would have thrown the price up, so we made just one mold, which is why we had to buy the time, uh, because it was going to be hand cast and, and then sort of fabricated, and they bought the materials, and that's the molds. So that's where the misting system is integrated in that profile. So the profile is not just an extruded profile, which a big company would have otherwise given us. And it's very light, so two people can carry it. Uh, and as these components got finished, uh, they were put on a truck, taken to site, and people spent a few weeks uh, erecting them, came back, made more, and it took two, two, two years, three years with the plants uh, to actually happen. Uh, and that's the facade with the misting system in play. So it actually is used to cool the building or to wash the plants, not for the hydration of the plants, which is really drip irrigation. So this is a cooling mechanism in the way that little hut uh, it's also to create atmosphere uh, if you needed to uh, you needed to do that and so that is sort of the progression of the building through these components uh, that's what it looks like with its base and where the parking is all incorporated and the misting is sort of used uh, in the midday when the building gets really warm uh, and of course the different species are now beginning to appear and that is the catwalk where uh, the hydroponic trays are and so people can cultivate this and again I think one of the big missions in the project was besides the notion of creating employment and beginning to take a program like this and uh, create these sort of counterpoints was this idea of what might green jobs be so here now they employ 20 gardeners and the gardeners are linked their lives and their livelihoods are linked to the facade of the building so they are green jobs in a sense, but also talking about softening thresholds, you know, in a corporate kind of culture, in a polarized society like India, the boss would arrive in a Mercedes Benz with tinted glasses, drive past the gardeners toiling away in the garden and go up to his or her office. But here the gardeners now penetrate the building. They make eye contact with their employees. Uh, and this has created a very interesting uh, synergy uh, through the building. And that's sort of the different facades and what they're beginning to look like. That's the CEO's office. He's got his blinds down, but he can the green is yet there, the entrance lobby, a section of the building which is also a series of stacked courtyards uh, with skylights which allow the hot air to go up, but also the program needed a kind of stacking sectionally, uh, the entrance zone, uh, the, you know, the, the, the atrium of one of the courtyards, and these are different departments that are interconnected within the section. Uh, the top floor with the cafeteria, and that's the gardeners working. They penetrate, they can actually penetrate the entire building without permission. And this woman would not normally wear such a beautiful sari if she was a gardener toiling in the garden. But here she is visible, uh, aware. Uh, they make eye contact. They talk to each other. They try to bribe each other. The bosses say, cut that a little more. I want white flowers. So there's a kind of synergy which for me is very important. And that's what it looks like sitting in the context of the in electronic park or you know, office park that is evolving in, in Hyderabad. And I mean, there are 20 of them, uh, but I think they're really proud of the facade because in a sense they make the facade and the, the, the health of the facade depends on them. So when we talk about globalizing local programs, I'll show you three. Uh, this is for Magic Bus, which, is, uh, which involves slum children. Magic Bus is an NGO that has five buses which are painted red and they're called magic bus because they take the slum children through their networks of NGOs on weekends to a campus they wanted to build to, for recreation, for health and you know, lessons and all of that. And they basically have these buses and this was the campus and we sort of worked it out as a series of pavilions. Uh, they, of course, this was when we got a brief that they wanted to evoke an Indian village and for me that didn't make much sense because you know, these slum dwellers, uh, if you call them slum dwellers, the informal city or whatever, they are, some of them are middle class to start with, but not only that, uh, these are second and third generation dwellers who don't have any connection with the village. They don't even have a nostalgia for it. They are urban people. So instead, the constraint we set ourselves was we said, and this was a self-imposed constraint as a research project, is that we would use materials that slums are made of. And that was our constraint. Because we thought not only for the familiarity for these children of the materials they see, but by reconfiguring them in new ways, they might be inspired as they repair their houses to do things differently. 
So the project then became a way of communicating how these things could be reconfigured. But more than that, also to evolve a typology of different types that could be re-embedded in these settlements as community centers or health centers. So we said, let's create a kit of parts which has services and living spaces, occupiable spaces, flexible spaces, et cetera. And so it's a very simple set of buildings. Uh, but on a module uh, that uses these sort of simple materials. Uh, it's, some of them are very flexible and open. Uh, this is the dining room, for example. Uh, it's on a module, so bunk beds can sort of, everyone has light, they have comfortable living sort of uh, conditions. Um, but it uses the intelligence by which slums are really made, which is very quick, very light. Uh, you know, the base is usually always made in stone for firm kind of conditions and foundations, very light superstructures so they can be extended these are all the materials that are usually prevalent in those settlements, which are now reconfigured in this case, and this gateway building, which also has, and that's just sort of galvanized metal, it's not stainless steel, and these are terraces where outdoor things can happen. But also imagining how they can go back into these conditions. And so that got us interested through these engagements and looking at actually on the ground what was happening, and I began talking to friends who sort of run NGOs in Mumbai. <coughs> Excuse me. And one of them called Spark had just got a project to do 300 toilets, uh, which the World Bank was funding. Uh, talking again about the exhibition, about the intervention of uh, agencies. Uh, and that's why I like very much the way your banner reads and challenges architects, citizens, experts to engage and negotiate urban planning. Because I think that really is the call of the day. It's a beautiful banner. Uh, compliments to you all who sort of thought it through. But how does one even engage with this? And so, I mean, just these numbers on the trajectory we are on are mind-boggling. How can we as architects not engage with what will be three billion people uh, living in these conditions, uh, as I just showed you? And this is really going to happen. Uh, and basically, the debate has been characterized by these stages of denial, of eradication, then of tolerance, of improvement, as in upgrading slums, et cetera. But how do we, as designers, speculate and anticipate? Uh, and that becomes, I think, of course, anticipation is about regional imaginations, because I do believe that it's affordable housing, and of course, that's a lecture in itself, that the solution of these settlements lie. But the time lag is amazing, and I think the notion of time and planning we must recognize as designers, because yes, we can think of all these wonderful imaginations like we do in our studios at the GSD, at MIT, in other places, at McGill, but also the life of a little child like that for 15 years growing up would be fundamentally altered uh, if one could recognize this problem. And this is an image I took quite spontaneously of this child who jumped out of that slum going to school. And I looked at it later and I was moved because I thought, you know, there's white socks, a smile on his face, a white shirt. He probably defecated in the open before he got ready because he had no toilet uh, to use. And that is the statistic. In Mumbai, there's one toilet for 1,440 people. That's the statistic. It's mind boggling. I mean, the city has a target of one is to 50, which means six families would share a toilet, even in their best aspirations to transform the area. So it's a humongous problem. And of course, how do you get challenged by it? And so we did surveys and we began to study toilets and we found toilets dilapidated very quickly. We found women and children couldn't go near these toilets because the contractors who ran them took the bulbs off to save the money because they charge a small fee for it and by removing the bulb at night and saving on electricity, their margins of profit were higher. And everyone was defecating everywhere but in the toilet. Uh, and it was just totally incredible. So we, of course, came up with a prototype, which was interesting. We were constrained by the World Bank specs, so they wanted to have a proper structure. We would have done this quite differently. But essentially, we made a couple of moves which I thought were very interesting. One is, of course, I went to one of my clients uh, who I did one of these weekend houses for, and as he was sipping his Johnny Walker scotch, which is very popular with Indians, I told him this horrible story about 1,400 people per toilet, and, he, and then asked him for a sponsorship of solar panels, and, and he right away helped, and we got sponsorship for six toilets for solar panels to get it off the grid. But what we did was we stacked the toilets in our prototype, put the women and children above so they were safer. We put the caretaker of the toilet, which is usually the lowest caste uh, in India who cleans the toilets. We gave them the penthouse. 
uh, and we put them up there. So they had the best view, and we put a community center next to them, hoping that there would be a dissolution of the kind of cultural taboos, and people, children could use that to study at night, and women for adult education, and we looked at local materials like bamboo. I also thought, let's sort of uh, shield this in flowers, because that would change the association of the toilet. Anyway, we applied it, and we made presentations to the municipal corporation, and spent hours and hours, and drew these beautiful images showing how the... And we found, we did about five or six of these designs up to working drawings, and they never went beyond the foundation, the plinth, because the government stopped it. And then, in talking to the municipal officers, one realized that they, this was a clash of visions about the city. We were imagining a city that would be human-centric, that would create a condition of sanitation. How do you modernize the city without sanitizing it, and how do you sanitize it without modernizing it became a kind of crazy mantra for us. But in the imagination of the government, that was transient. I mean, that was going to go in the next year at the most. They were going to make high-rise buildings where these guys could live, and then the rest would be given to a developer. And we had colliding visions, and then one of the engineers finally told me, sir, what you're doing is you're creating an iconic building, and if you do that and make a community center and they get organized, they'll never let us demolish them. So they saw the purpose of what architecture might do in terms of threatening this, which was interesting as a learning. And so we, of course, did many schemes, and none of them were. And then I finally told Spark, let's go to a really remote slum and build it. I was getting impatient as a designer, and we built it. So we built one with solar panels. There it sits. The kids are up there. Uh, they really enjoyed it. That's housing the government did 10 years ago, and nobody moved there. So I think one is right in trying to create infrastructure like this, even if it's you know, for a short period of time. And it was simple materials, bamboo slats, I mean, nice environment. You got, suddenly you got outlook points. People began to see the settlements there. The solar panels worked. And then it was a complete failure because after that, when I went back six months later, the government built one of their new pro old prototypes. And this had been taken over by the men folk in the slum, and it became their club because that top penthouse was wonderful in the evenings, watching cricket, drinking rum, and it got taken over. And so it was a failure, and one had to reconcile oneself to this failure. And one began to think about it, and of course one realized that, like I keep complaining about impatient capital, one was an impatient designer who wanted to realize this. And by going off to a, a, a slum where the NGO didn't have a working relationship, this tripartite arrangement between designer, NGO, community hadn't been established. Of course it had been co-opted by the politicians, the local goons. It was a money project, and then it became a space for them, uh, which they now happily use. And so this was a, a real sort of failure. And, and, you know, I, of course, keep looking at this, and it's interesting because maybe one has to fail better. I mean, that's the best one can think on these complex projects, because failure is, again, something we don't discuss, but I think one can learn from failure, and one can fail better, because these are very, very complex projects. And so we recently won the first prize in a Gates uh, Foundation competition for toilets, uh, and uh, We've now worked a way out. I don't know if it'll happen, because the competition happened after they had already appointed the people to make 600 toilets in North India. So when I went to the NGOs doing this and showed them our design and said, we won the first prize, they said, no, no, we've already finalized this. So I think there was some slippage there between the foundation's intentions. But essentially what we did here was went even further and said, now if you embed it in the community, what would happen? Put commerce into the toilets where there's boil, I mean, you know, hygienic water soap that is sold, and what would happen? So we, are, we failed, but maybe this time we'll fail better. And someone described working in India being like a mahut who looks after elephant, who mounts the elephant. And this is this complex place, and the elephant throws you off once in a while and tramples you, almost kills you, and then you struggle, and you get back on the mahut and steer your way through. And really, my experiences of working there, the complex landscape, all these transitions that are occurring, these meta-narratives I was describing, it really feels like that. And so with that, I'll end with this last project, which is a housing, low-cost housing project for the Mahuts, who are among the poorest people in Rajasthan, in Jaipur. They earn 5,000 rupees, which is about $100 US dollars. And they may be, if they're lucky, they get 20 more dollars as tips. And they look after these wonderful beasts 
who also don't keep very well because there's no reason they should be in a des desert climate. They're tropical beings. It's an accident of history that the Mughals bought them here for ceremony, uh, for pomp, uh, for battle, perhaps. Uh, and so this is an amazing contemporary disjuncture that exist, and this is what they do. They take tourists up, they get painted, and that's why their skin discolors. Uh, this is where they live, uh, where the government had sort of provided housing for them, which is like garages, and the mahouts live above. And that doesn't work, because the relationship that the mahout and the elephant has is a very complex one. In fact, the mahout is the only one who can control it. They cultivate their relationship with the elephant, and so you can't detach them in the way that... So this obviously began to fail. And many NGOs band together and push the government into doing a competition, which we won. And this was the site they gave us, one hill, and the rest had been quarried by sand contractors to sell the sand for construction. So it was a series of voids. And of course, we converted it into a landscape project because my first sort of read on the project and its analysis was, unless we had water, there was no point doing anything. Architecture was easy to do here, so you just couldn't privilege architecture, which is a great learning even in retrospect because sometimes you're confronted similarly like failure in these complex projects of even detaching yourself from privileging architecture, and that's what we had to do. We made it a landscape project because we said collecting water would be critical. And of course, this is a long story, very complex with governments falling and being resurrected and corruption, but I won't go into that. And this is what the site looked like, but I saw on Google image clear paths for water. So we came up with a system of a series of micro dams that would collect the water, and we've built about that much. This is yet going to happen. Uh, and so these water bodies, and then whatever land was above the quarried areas, we kept for the housing. And essentially, it, like I said, it was a landscape project. We looked at you know, local species and did all of that research, but this is what we achieved in three years. That's the same hill. By just cutting the land, the government gave us no money because landscape wasn't in the specifications. And so what we had to do was basically get the contractor as they were. They were very keen to build the buildings, naturally. Uh, and so we, in the process of doing that, we got their help in cutting the land to some extent. But for three years, it just lay. They never moved anyone in because the government that had started the project collapsed, and the new government wanted to detach itself from the project strategically. And the site just lay for three years, and it completely regenerated its own ecology uh, with these local species and stabilized uh, the landscape. And of course, uh, Jaipur is where you shouldn't have elephants, like I said, but now we've managed in these three years to achieve the 20, 000, 20 million liters of water which is actually needed. Uh, just by. And the housing, of course, this is the brief, which is row housing, uh, typically sites and services, narrow frontage, deep interior, you minimize the infrastructure, but we kind of change it to do this, which is essentially take the same 40 square meter house and add a little courtyard so it gives it expansion, but then large courtyard shared between three houses. So these become villas because most of these people actually use the open spaces. So it is a, again a strategic way both combining water as well as combining uh, the configuration of the housing to to kind of attempt to balance the asymmetry that happens in this society, subversively, perhaps. And so that's what it works out to. That's the unit. That's where the elephant stays, and this is the food storage. But it creates these looser configurations that allow much more appropriation, which hasn't yet happened. But that's what the model looked like, and that's the elephant. Uh, and. Uh, and also, of course, it sort of climatically worked out that you have the hot air rising. This is used for food storage. That roof was engineered. So the food, because they have to store a lot of food for the elephant, but it allows to, it to work climatically in a very, very hot place. And elephants, interestingly, can't lie on flat ground because that's where they always lie on berms. They can't get up otherwise. Uh, and so this was what site visits looked like because, I mean, I can do my own version of um, uh, extra large, large, medium, and small uh, because, uh, you know, one looked at elephants of these sizes. Uh, and that's what it looked like, the first water body. This has been done. They've now begun to occupy it. Uh, this, after this last monsoon, you can begin to see how the, the, the environment is regenerating. These will be plastered and painted as people begin to occupy it, and they give them the, the ability to do that. So, of course, housing is soft. It corrodes. It gets transformed, and it must be designed like that. And, of course, children have to be protected, so we created these openings where the kids of the mahout can play with the elephants without being threatened by them. 
uh, and that sort of a nice relationship. And different people have colonized their clusters differently uh, because they're different sub-communities within that. And this is you know, a guy coming back from work. You can see the camber in the floor. And we tried to create a series of porosities layering through fenestrations and openings. So you began to get you know, interesting vistas, but also community beginning to engage with itself and not isolated on account of the architecture. And after two monsoons, that's what it looks like. So while the middle class and the rich in Jaipur yet get tankers of water in the summer because the water supply runs out in the municipality, people here who are the poorest in terms of community actually have a surplus of water. They have bogan villas, they have gardens, they have lawns. They are actually playing out the middle class and upper middle class fantasies because of the surplus of water uh, in a sense. And of course, now life is beginning to corrode it. People are moving in. They use the outside to cook. Uh, the goats have arrived. Uh, you see them all over. The trees are beginning to... It'll transform completely. I have no idea where it'll go. Housing must be malleable. We are yet concentrating, now that the government has taken this seriously, we are concentrating on repairing bits of the site so that we can collect more water. We are yet interested in uh, reinforcing the ecology of the place because in the long run, that's the armature that will life, let life sort of be celebrated in a sense. And, and you know, it is a, a, a tough climate. Uh, for those of you who might have been to Jaipur, this is what they do. They take you up these ramparts. And I was told recently an elephant went rogue because it's so hot, or three years ago, sorry, not, not us, since we've done the project, because they became very temperamental because they had no water. This is the kind of landscape. They walk seven, they used to walk 12 kilometers to work on hot roads like that. In Jaipur, it's 50 degrees centigrade in the summer. Now they can have a snack on their way to work because the green and their whole environment has changed. Those trees will grow soon. Of course, this is a three-year-old video. Uh, so a lot of this has begun uh, to change. And, uh, and of course, uh, the water is what also helps the bonding between the mahout and the elephant because the process of bathing uh, is what uh, actually creates that incredible bond because it's soothing for the elephant and uh, it, it, it's something that the elephant temperamentally appreciates a great deal. And so this is a mahout who is sort of enjoying his time with these elephants who now, and even in the summer, the water doesn't go away. So it has completely transformed uh, through the ecology uh, what the life for a lot of these people is about. And now, of course, the government is giving us budgets. We're beginning to reinforce the water, so hopefully more will stay. Um, and this is the second water body. This is an image from this last monsoon, so we're collecting much more water than we had imagined. You can see the vegetation beginning to re... And this is all local key local species in the area uh, that are in some parts of the site which are more depressed where water collects more easily are beginning to get as thick as what you see. Elephants are also very social. You can't isolate them. So we created these very inexpensive pavilions where they can meet in the evenings and chat. <laughs> and very quickly what happened was that you had a whole tourism develop as a result of that because it went viral on Facebook and a lot of folks of that age like to go and get their pictures so they can put it up on Facebook. So now tourists sort of come and there's a whole economic ecology that is beginning to develop and their incomes are getting supplemented uh, as a result of this. And this is a little cluster which hasn't been occupied. And you know, nature has begun to take it over. I don't know what will happen when it gets occupied, they'll paint it. But you can see how there's a transformation of the landscape which will of course change the quality quality of life. And now we are trying to, these are self-initiated, we are trying to convince the government to do a kind of non-building, which would be a visitor center, which will bring more income into the area. Uh, the mouths now have, ch they have children, and as more families, 100 families are going to move in there, so there'll be 400 children, probably. And so we renovated some old broken structures into a little school, and an American NGO is now running a little school there for the children of the mahouts. So. Essentially, it was really a project about creating a kind of ecology uh, around all these questions. Uh, of course, worrying about the architecture to the extent we could, but also recognizing that architecture can't be always privileged, but it's also malleable. And so, <coughs> in just in conclusion, I'll take a minute. You know, as the world in South Asia, India, places like Africa, Latin America, things Mirko sort of in his introduction talked about, up becoming increasingly global, I think we have to be cautious about accepting that things are growing more alike because they begin to look more alike. Because when we engage with a deeper excavation of the site on which we operate as designers, with an understanding that draws on both the objective realities as well as the subjective perceptions of the site, I think the differences emerge more strikingly than before. The differences were actually assured when things looked different. So architects obviously have to find more rigorous ways 
of defining this complex emerging cultural fabric of multiple aspirations that collide in space and get manifest in the built environment in a mutinous democracy like India that's going through these multiple transitions and many other forces among those meta-narratives and disjunctures that I described to you. And more importantly, to see this cultural fabric as an ever-evolving landscape. You know, Arjun Apudurai says, culture is a dialogue between aspirations and sedimented traditions. So in these interpretations that we as designers make of a place of culture, ideas of the future as much as those of the past necessarily have to be embedded and nurtured because the future is the aspirational landscape that we have to worry about. The highly pluralistic environment of South Asia, India, require planning and design mechanisms, I believe, and attitudes that negotiate continually between differences, that blur these boundaries and these binaries, um, those of architecture as the sole instrument of placemaking and temporality, that one that creates conditions for inhabitation, transaction, celebration, uh, the binary of the state and the market, of the empowered and the poor, rather than allowing one entity to prevail and remake the city in its image, which is what I think characterizes China, for example. And this is what, I, for me at least, makes working in Mumbai and the landscape of India unique and really challenging and difficult in some ways. Because I think once the architect sees these various differences as being simultaneously valid, I think that is the operational idea. How do you accept the simultaneous validity of these conflicting ideas? Then, of course, the challenge for us as designers is to go beyond beyond their polarized binaries in terms of our design imagination, spatial configurations, et cetera. And I think then that truly becomes a space in which I believe we will engage with architecture, nature, and also society much more meaningfully. Thank you very much. Uh, do you think it's possible to convince gated communities to give back to the community and open up there's no, not <laughs> well, no, no. I mean, that's by a, special taxes, even or no. I mean, well, I mean, I think design can play a role in doing that. But uh, yeah, I mean, of course, uh, there's no simple answer to that. I mean, I think that's a planning question in what we open up as land and what's at least happening in India. Uh, is interesting that in this liberalized economy, for the first time, uh, a very sacred law, which was about converting agricultural land to urban land, suddenly opened up. And a lot of speculation on, and speculators began to move into that space, which is disconnected from infrastructure, unlike the Chinese model where infrastructure led uh, the opening up of SEZs, et cetera. And so Bhagwati, who's an economist in Colombia, you know, describes the Indian condition as putting a scaffolding on a building after the building is built versus using its SEZs as that condition. So in my reading, the, the gated communities which come out of the special economic zones and that imagination is a terrible nexus that has occurred between the politicians and developers and private uh, sector to just convert land while they could use that mechanism within the guise of liberalization. So, of course, there have been reactions to it. You know, the Tata Nano car in Kolkata, the whole reaction to moving the factory out from the NSEZ, et cetera, is all reactions. So there are reactions to that. And I think in a democracy, it plays itself out, and democracy allows those corrections. But it's a slow process because they have vested interests. Now, within that, I think in, in, within a city, design can play a great role in softening those thresholds, perhaps through design, incorporating other things that blur those sort of hard thresholds. But when you go out on a flight 100 kilometers from a city, I mean, I'm not sure what else you can do uh, besides addressing questions of sustainability or questions of you know, zero carbon or closing loops on energy systems and things like that. So it's a, it's a more complex problem, which I think... Uh, so to answer your question in one line, I'm not sure I can convince them not to have gated committees. Thank you, Rahul, for a wonderful, mm -hmm, fresh, tropical breath of air on a cold day. Uh, I would, uh, perhaps you are being polite to Mirko mm, when you say uh, Latin America, Africa, mm, <coughs> South Asia. When mm, Angola is bankrolling mm, Portugal, this mindset that you uh, want to continue, I think mm, your presentation kind of mm, poses a very good question, I think. So perhaps that entire divide, it's time to re-question. Do you have some ideas on that? And Mirko, if you want to, you can j join in that too. 
Problem. No, but Vikram, I mean, I would, I, I totally, you know, I think it's a very good point, but it's, that's, this is where capital becomes very fluid. It gets recycled back through these places, but the kind of uh, physical reality, uh, I think the question is, what are the implications there? So when Angola is bankrolling Portugal and capital is flowing back and forth from what might be perceived as underdeveloped countries, uh, the question is, does it roll back and then in what form? Uh, and, and, and what does that mean for design? I mean, is that correct? So, I mean, I, I think I, my response to your, your uh, observation would be clarifying it in those terms. Come and do a fellowship at the CCA. <laughs> no, 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 uh, no I, I mean, I think, you know, I could, I could title this talk Cross Subsidy. Uh, and, uh, and I think, I mean, that's how I kind of operate. So, for example, both, I'm going to talk both about optimism, but also economic cross subsidy, because for young practice, I mean, how do you, you know, how do you engage with some of these things? So, like, for example, the toilet project is something, it's just self-initiated. It's, it's not, not, we're not paid for it. We, we just do it knowing something else with cross subsidize it. And uh, we're even raising money for it by getting solar panels. Or so the elephant village, it's now the seventh year. We ran out of our fee in the first year because that's, the government said it's going to be done in one year, but we knew it wasn't right. So then you begin to cross subsidize these projects, which I think is part of the optimism uh, question, but also in terms of time, because we as a practice have very consciously, we are yet doing little interiors sometimes, we yet do a house, we, we do things that work on different time scales, which keeps your optimism, so you're not just dealt with failure all the time. So while you're failing on, failing on something, you're doing another beautiful object. I've not even shown most of those things because I think in the context of this lecture, I didn't want to. But you know, we had, so it's, it's the economic model and the optimism is part of it, but it's also, you know, I think engaging with social questions is, even if you fail, I think it brings some optimism to your kind of being, yeah. Yes, tell me, are there any more, uh, or how many are there like you in India? How many people are working this way? Oh gosh, I should ask Vikram to answer that question, but uh, no, no, there's, there, yes, no, I, I think, no, that's a very good question. I, you know, I, I just did this book on architecture in India, and I, I divided it by models of engagement. Uh, and I think the argument I was trying to make there, which I'm trying to now make with a talk like this, is we often, there are many people working in each of the different kinds of things I showed you, including social projects. There's a wonderful work being happened. There's a young architect in Ahmedabad called Yatin Pandya who's working on taking just recycled materials and building community centers. There are people all over the south, that landscape I was showing you, who have built, picked on the Laurie Baker tradition, for example, uh, the barefoot architect. But there are not many people who are crossing over and doing these things simultaneously, which goes back to the question of optimism and even economic cross-subsidy. And I think one of the reasons for that's why I end with the idea of simultaneous validity, we begin to lay our alliances in particular models of practice. Uh, and I think the argument I'm making is that within the kind of pluralistic uh, simultaneity of the Indian context, actually we should be questioning our models of engagement and actually also simultaneously engaging in different ways. So all the way from a corporate kind of project, which is instructions that are codified as tender drawings and to working with people on site and building. Uh, and why shouldn't we be doing that simultaneously? And I think education plays a big role in this because education is very singular in the kind of imagination of what engagement and practice is. Uh, I think it's, partly reinforced by accreditation. It's you know, reinforced by many factors that make us very singular in what we imagine is the mode we could engage with. And I think models of engagement must enter pedagogy in a serious way uh, in, in exposing young people to the simultaneous validity of different ways of making things. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about your 
can you hear me? I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about your worldview in terms of um, what sort of enables you to do these types of social projects long term <laughs> without, you know, we mentioned optimism earlier on, but in specific, what is, what is it that sort of drives you sort of for, for the long term to continue working in this way, to engage socially with, with these, these types of architectural projects, and to, and to do that for, for an extended period of time. I mean, what if you could talk about what is it that you have optimism in and what sort of keeps you running um, you know, through, throughout your, your career? Well, you know, uh, I think it's the stability of a three-legged stool, perhaps. And that's why one, I mean, I'm just using that as a, is, and that's why I think the writing, the publication, the engagement with research, uh, with building and with advocacy maybe uh, is, is interesting again in the question of model of practice because if I look back uh, and I'm just beginning to actually reflect on my work. I had a long discussion with Mirko this afternoon about this question that I feel prepared to reflect about the work because one has entered it through looking at the broader landscape, looking at architecture in India, what I was defining as the meta-narratives. I think when we begin to only think of the context as a locality and lose sight of that going back and forth, uh, which happens in places like India because people don't have the opportunity of exposure, travel, institutions aren't very strong, very few good schools but not many, uh, that you begin to then run into a wall of pessimism because you take a track and it leads you nowhere. But I think if you can slip sideways continuously, you move forward in a, at a different speed, but it's, I think, uh, more sustainable, um, just to use that terribly often used word. It's more, not sustainable, but it's more robust maybe, that you feel, uh, uh, they, you feel a better sense of stability. Uh, I think. So for me to oscillate between beautifully crafted things and there's a satisfaction you get from that, like we do in houses for you know, more affluent clients, but also sometimes to fail becomes more bearable. <laughs> uh, and then if you have the luxury to reflect about, I'm serious, I mean, I think even the idea of coming and spending time in a place like this or teaching is a mode of reflection. And I think reflection strengthens you uh, to negotiate this, these complexities, uh, I think, uh, more appropriately, perhaps. So I think it's a combination of, uh, of, of all of those things. And, and, you know, I think for me also, like, preservation has been a very, very important influence. We've done a lot of preservation work, but it puts a different perspective on time. It, it's a different mode of engagement. Those projects I showed you, we do measure drawings just for our own satisfaction to know where we are going. But with a craftsman, it's not giving them specs. It's sitting with them and mixing the lime and getting it tested in a lab. So, it's, so each of these models of engagements have different protocols and processes and modes of instruction, which, is, which pedagogy doesn't prepare you for. Uh, we then have models and we reflect on people who've over 20 years found a way of doing something and we celebrate them. But it's not at the level of your undergraduate graduate or graduate studies even, uh, you know. So I think that's something that for the academy is worth pondering about. And this is where I think these other landscapes, whether it's Angola looping back to Portugal or not, but it's these landscapes where transformation is occurring at rapid rates is where we should look at for what might be the new models of practice. Because I think people, students, my students in North America, when I talk to them, I, you know, I can see them working in Africa in five years, in India in 10 years, in China at some point. So are we preparing them for being able to sl slide sideways and with the ease that I think practice and engagement needs today is, I think, important. Um, I, was, I was touched by your, by your um, last example of the ele elephant village and in particular how you um, spoke knowingly of the, the special relationship between the um, the caretaker of the elephant and the elephant itself. And um, uh, I was uh, particularly personally touched because I'm involved in a project here in the city in Montreal to uh, restore stables where there are horses. Oh. And it gave me ideas as to how we could, you know, obviously we have the same situation here where people are very attracted to the, the animals and want to see them. And, and, um, and so uh, I was, uh, uh, and then uh, and similar but different, the, the whole hydrology of the site that you, that you spoke of, and uh, I visited Calcutta a few years ago where all of the sewage water of the city is cleaned in a, um, basically sewage 
uh, is cleaned in a, 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 a wetland that was uh, constructed 40, 50 years ago and uh, that very few people go to, but that actually cleans all of the water. <coughs> so my question is, um, are you seeing that, um, how is, you could say, nature being integrated into cities or hydrology in particular? In, uh, do you see that there's a trend or an interest in, in uh, integrating the two and, and the sensibility that you showed uh, for uh, nature, whether it be water or plants, yeah. do you see that being developed more uh, for get with government bodies, for example? I, I don't see it happening very much in India. There's, there's a, there are a couple of good landscape architects in the southern states who are doing stuff, um, uh, which is interesting, but not adequately. I mean, it's, it's I mean, Singapore and, the, and Europe and places like that, from what I understand, have much more happening. But, you know, in the case of the Elephant Village, for whatever it's worth, it's, I mean, we had ideas and plans and you know, to schemes to do exactly all the stuff you were talking about. But we ran into an interesting problem, which I was unprepared for, which is it's a government commission. Their specs are limited. So even, you know, our landscape architect or consultant said you have to line the water bodies. And there was a special rubber, and he got all the specs and the costs and the agencies. And of course, it wasn't in the spec. I, by chance, happened to have tea with an old craftsman on site, and I was despairing and saying, this is terrible, we're going to lose this monsoon, and we've done the pits, but we can't line it. And you know, he, with all his wisdom, just said, to, and that was such an important moment in the project for me, he said to me, don't worry, I know this place, the clay here, if it has rain, and it can stay wet, it won't crack, so it'll form its own layer, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, and so it happened out of that kind of local intelligence, which is low cost, and you know, uh, one thought about all of that, but then, you know, it's, again, there's an institutional limitation here in terms of framework, and one can learn. So the challenge really is, okay, one can share these projects. How can one loop this back? So that's why that idea of failure, fail better. Really what I mean by that is, so what is the task to do another design like I did for that competition, or kind of get engaged in institutional transform transformations? Because, I mean, if some unless we change the specs and we get the government to actually privilege landscape and all the systems you're describing as part of their imagination of a project, it's going to be always subvertive tactics, no? So uh, I think that becomes a very big question. At least that's something I'm thinking about now. Uh. Uh. You were talking before about sustainability, you know, is uh, a word uh, that sometimes is not used in a proper way. But anyway, um, I would like to get your opinion on uh, what we are at now. Like, what is uh, your opinion on the situation of worldwide about sustainability and uh, what is going to be in the future the sustainability? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, my, I, have, I don't, uh, it's not something I've thought about deeply, but, but I'll, I'll just say something, which is that I think we have to be careful that it doesn't, this, these discussions don't get universalized. They've become universalized, and there's a kind of hegemony of the West now on the debate, and that too from the high-tech architects. So, so I think the narratives then get constructed according to that. A green industry develops, that reinforces the narratives and per perpetuates it. So I think we can't universalize these categories. And I think for me, from my experience, that's been the biggest learning. That um, what do you mean by sustainability in a place differs completely. For me, using the social as material in the case of that building and the gardeners being employed is as important for the sustainability debate as the insulation I'm using to seal my windows or you know, whatever. So I, I, think, I think the universalizing of these categories is what I think we have to be most cautious about. There is a last question. Okay, fine. So uh, perhaps I ask you the last question, oh, okay. which is uh, how do you transfer this uh, point about a different uh, uh, model of engagement in your role at GSD as a chair of the urban design uh, uh, department at uh, Harvard GSD? <coughs> Yeah, so I, I think through the idea of models of engagement. So I think that one is trying to, in the studio, I'll just give you one example. In my mind, we have created a, we've constructed a matrix which is across geographies 
and across models of engagement. And so in just the studio offerings, for example, what we are doing now is uh, having uh, offerings across those geographies because each of those geographies throw up completely different kinds of questions and problems, which then challenge the question of models of you know, practice. And so we bring then people who uh, actually can respond to that. Uh, and so those modes, uh, I think, is something that at least I'm interested in. It's harder to do it within the framework of theoretical offerings because of requirements and accreditation and all of that. But the studio becomes, a, I think, a really fertile ground uh, to begin to explore some of this. <coughs> 